you're in the Disruptors Club. Guys, this is the second part of our interview with Chris Bricky from Stockspot. And he tells us all about how he had to grow to become a founder and how he had to change his business to be successful. You know, I, I was in a pretty good job, a job that I loved, um, but I said, look, I think it's worth me spending a couple of years seeing if, if, it's, if, this, if there's a business in this. Um, and, and Did you have investment at the time? So at the time, no, I, I basically um, did a bit of a personal budget and I realized that, look, I could survive, you know, a, a year, a year and a half potentially um, with no income. Um, so I, I was fortunate that I had a little bit of savings set aside and, you know, it's not something that all founders have, but I worked out that I, you know, could, could um, survive for a while. Um, the good thing is I realized I could only survive for a while and it wasn't infinite. And I think actually having that as a motivator was very powerful. <laughs> Um, so actually, you know, setting myself a deadline of, look, I've only got 18 months to not only, you know, prove out this concept, but get a product up and running and actually be able to pay myself some sort of salary, um, you know, really drove me to work pretty hard in those early days to get something up and running um, and probably cut corners in a good way. So, you know, I, I think in financial services, there's a tendency to, you know, go through a very sort of slow and rigorous process of, um, you know, even from a kind of legal perspective and, you know, and pay a lot in legal fees to get approval. Um, I think probably where my time was most efficiently used in that first year because of the cost of legal fees was just reading all of the legislation about investing and financial advice and then just coming up with my own opinions on whether we could launch this business. So, so Chris, in, in your business, uh, I think every founder has sort of, um, I guess what I call a superpower something where you are 10 times better than everyone else. You're, you know, you naturally gravitate towards, and it's almost hard to see sometimes within your, your business, you know, um, or in, in your life, right? Um, but I think understanding yourself and then with every superpower comes a weakness, mm -hmm. um, like Superman's weakness is kryptonite, right? Um, and each of those superpowers, that it manifests a weakness within the company as well. How, how are you going about sort of, how have you gone and, see, it sounds like to me you've gone through a lot of self-discovery within this, right? You've grown to be a people manager, you've grown to be a, a CEO, grown to be a founder from being a trader because it's very different. How, how, do, how do you go about continuing to grow yourself? How do you, how do, you do that? I think speaking, spending time with other founders is a great way to do that. Um, you, you learn a lot, I think, from other people who have gone through, you know, similar but sometimes, you know, slightly different, um, you know, ways of growing a business and, and you learn a lot from that. So something, you know, that, that we've started to do recently with a, a group of founders that all, all have, have the common investor is actually just meet up more often um, to share stories and, and talk about the problems we're facing. and. Um, you know, it shouldn't be surprising, but a lot of those problems are the same problems. And, and you know, founders, you know, it's, it's almost a, a type of therapy is founders getting together and, and talking about the, you know, the, the problems that they're facing and how they're solving them. Um, so I think that's, you know, one great way to do it. Um, I, I think sort of, you know, reading and, and, and learning and, and listening to, you know, all, all sorts of different mediums where different founders are sort of interviewed is, is great as well. Um, you know, there's a whole series of fantastic you know, podcasts and, and books sort of interviewing founders about the problems they've faced along the way. Um, but also I, I find probably most useful understanding the sort of framework for how founders should be th thinking about um, solving problems. So I think that's an area where, you know, I've probably grown the most over the last few years is actually trying to, to de develop my own framework around, you know, how do you make decisions within a business? There's, there's so many variables and there's so many different moving parts. And as a founder, your job is to actually, you know, make sure your head's over all of those different variables. Some of them are external to your business. They're the kind of the macro things that are happening, you know, competition, the industry itself, you know, then there's a lot of you know, internal variables. How do you, um, you know, on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, decide what's the next most important thing for you to do as a business, um, given all of those moving parts. And I think that's something not only is important to get right, but also um, how you communicate that with the team. Um, you know, something probably in the early days I, I wasn't as good at, um, but I, I've realized that the more um, transparent and the more open you are with your team about why you're making decisions in a certain way, 
um, you know, helps them to understand it um, and also helps to often like relieve some of the you know, anxiety they might feel about why you're doing it because they, 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 they start to realise that as a founder you're, you're not just operating within sort of one sort of tunnel vision which often you know, a, a single person in a business might be that you're trying to piece everything together as a giant puzzle. I guess within that journey of, of the business growing, um, you know, sometimes tactics work and they don't, they stop working as well and you need to go further. What are some of the ways you've changed StockSpot since you started in the original model and had to, had to evolve? I think one of the ways we've changed is probably the client service model. So originally, um, I, I thought, my theory was that you know people were would be comfortable with basically um, you know just trusting the 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 essentially the algorithms that we've built to manage their money, um, and really still we're still using um, you know these sorts of algorithms and and um, processes to manage people's money. But what I have um, realised more and more along the way is that people still need a hand to hold, mm-hmm. and they want someone to speak to along the way. And, and so probably an area that we've put more focus on is actually um, making sure clients know that if they need to um, give someone a call or they want to email someone or, or online chat with someone, that someone will be there and, and it will be a person um, that understands their situation, that understands, you know, investing and can actually guide them through that situation. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, as someone coming from the investment industry, I, I um, you know, I, I didn't put a lot of weight on the fact that, you know, investing is frightening for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and investing without someone to talk to or, or someone they feel they can lean on um, is, is something that not a lot of people are comfortable with. So, you know, in the early days, a lot of our early adopters, what we noticed was a lot of them actually came from engineering and tech backgrounds because a lot of these were people that um, didn't want to speak to people <laughs> and, and that, were, you know, were happy to trust, you know, computers to make the decisions and, and actually had no interest in having, you know, phone calls or emailing us. Um, so we, we noticed we had a huge growth in this sort of one area, which, which sort of surprised me, but it actually made me realize that in order to, um, you know, really connect with other parts, um, you know, of society who, who actually do want to speak to someone, we had to think about, you know, how could we, um, you know, offer a service model that allowed for that, um, but also make it clear that that was possible. So I think that was probably one of the early um, realizations I had.